Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tiger Talks. Um, my name is Emily Badix, and I am the Longmore Director, a Longmore Institute Interim Director. Uh, and it is my pleasure to be bringing you this Tiger Talks series, a collaboration between the Disability Visibility Project, Disability and Intersectionality Summit, and the Longmore Institute. A few access notes before we kick off our program today. You can access captioning via the CC button in Zoom, or if you'd like a more customized option, you can go to tinyurl.com slash longmore captions. And we've dropped that in the chat for you. We're only going to use the chat function today to share a couple key links with you. Uh, we invite you to use the Q&A box as if it's a chat community space. Uh, and we'll happily share that out if it's not accessible to you to multitask in that way and, and be uh, accessing that space. Um, we're keeping things real tight on time today, so our panelists will not have time to respond to that Q&A, um, but we'll definitely be sharing it with them as well afterwards. The hashtags for today's event are hashtag Tiger Talks and hashtag Year of the Tiger. And uh, we'll be announcing the book winners at the end of the program. So stay tuned for that. But we are going to give away a lot of books today, which is really fun. Um, we uh, Just a, a brief word from the Longmore Institute. We are so proud to get to work with Alice on this series once again. Uh, we worked with her on the launch of her first book, uh, Disability Visibility, and now this. And everyone who she introduces us to are just wonderful people to know. I've been reading all of the books in the series. And so I'm just very, very grateful that we get to do this collaboration. Um, I'm going to now say the remarks that Sandy Ho would have said, unfortunately, she is having uh, some, some things that's unfortunately common in the Bay Area, which is BART troubles. That's our Bay Area regional transit system. And uh, she's rushing back. So hopefully she'll make it in time to close out our program today. She was going to say uh, that today's community book launch and the other three events in the series, uh, so we've got one down and two more to come after this, uh, possibly more, um, have always been a part of Alice's Tiger plan. Whether you know of her work from the Disability Visibility Project or her Twitter presence as part of the team behind Crip the Vote, that's, ha that's hashtag, or from the anthology she created, um, of course, from her recent and very exciting collaboration with Jen White Johnson and Amy, that's A-I-M-I, Hamray, H-A-M-R-A-I-E, the Society of Disabled Oracles, which will be linked to in the chat. Um, we all know, right, that for uh, Alice, disability community is the way. And following Alice's illness and her ICU stay earlier this summer, it became even more important for this book to be launched from the disability community. And for all of us to come together in this very auspicious Year of the Tiger to celebrate our big cat friend, writer, mischief maker, and disabled oracle, Alice Wong. We are grateful to the writers who will be featured throughout this series of Community Tiger Talks. Um, so without further ado, let's kick it off and I pass it over to our moderator for today's event, Travis. Travis, thank you so much. Hello everyone. My name is Travis Chi Wing Lau. I am joining you from my home in Columbus, Ohio. I am a Chinese American gay man wearing a dark blue polka dotted shirt and seated before a bunch of bookcases. I teach 18th and 19th century British literature, health humanities, and disability studies at Kenyon College here in Ohio, but I also identify as a disabled poet. So it gives me great joy to be moderating this conversation this evening on all things lyrical in honor of Alice's incredible new book. And I would love to invite my co-panelists, Sejal and Jen, to introduce themselves. Thank you, Travis. Uh, 
I'm going to read from my bio because I haven't I haven't said it quite like this before. <laughs> Uh, I am a queer brown writer of Kenyan, Ugandan, Indian, Gujarati, and American nationality and or ethnicity. I identify as Asian American and a writer of color. I'm also a Libra. It is Libra season. And I'm an interdisciplinary artist, poet, dancer, fiction writer, and essayist. My first book is nonfiction and it was published in June 2020. This is one way to dance uh, essays on race, place, and belonging. And my second book is forthcoming in 2024 and it's fiction, short stories with photographs and letters. And it's called How to Make Your Mother Cry. And no, my mother does not like the title. I live on ancestral Seneca or Anandawaga land of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy, also known as Rochester, New York, which is my hometown. Uh, I am a brown woman uh, about the color of coffee and a cream and a half. And I'm wearing a, a striped shawl, kind of blue, purple, white. And I'm wearing my mother's dangly earrings um, of all different colors from the 60s. And I have some flowers, uh, calla lilies behind me, and a painting that I did when I was nine and a half. And I know this because it, it, I wrote nine and a half on the back of it. Should I introduce myself now, or do you want to do a reading, Sage? Oh my goodness, I I. Jen, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay. I was going to say do that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Um, hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Jen Soriano, and I am an activist and writer based in the ancestral and unceded land of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish people in the city otherwise known as Seattle. And I, um, li I live with chronic pain and an invisible and fluctuating disability that I explore some of the roots of in my first full-length essay collection that's going to be coming out next summer, August 2023, from Amistad Books. And it's called Nervous, but I, I feel like it could unofficially be titled How to Make Your Mother Cry or whatever your title was. Um, and uh, my mother does not know about it yet. I am a Filipinx American uh, non-binary person with asymmetric black hair with a red streak on one side. And um, I'm wearing these big Philippine sun yellow earrings and a black sweatshirt with a yellow tiger on it for the occasion. And the, the sweatshirt says, keep rising. And that's a reference to the organization that it's from, which is 18 million rising, which is how I know Alice because we were once on the board together. Um, and, oh, and um, yay Libra season. I'm a Leo. So I identify as part of the cat family and the cat menagerie. Um, and behind me, there actually is another cat. There's a tiger um, that my eight-year-old son made. So we have a child art theme going on. <laughs> and uh, there's also just a wood paneled wall and some clutter that includes a stuffed giraffe. Excellent. Thank you both for introducing yourselves. Um, just to recap how um, the structure of this evening is going to go, I'm now going to invite each of the uh, my co-panelists to read a portion from Alice's new book, and then we'll shift from there to a discussion among the panelists uh, in which I have some questions prepared. Either of you, you are welcome to take it away. Great, I'll jump in. So I am reading from an essay that's called A High-Risk Timeline of Alice Wong, Proto-Oracle. And I chose this because I think it's such a great example of how this book is 
uh, it's 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 a portal as in our title of this talk. It's a portal to access intimacy, but also to the future where access may not even be the frame that we are talking about anymore. Uh, and so I'll read a little bit from here. Location, Earth, North America, California, era pre-outrage. The Oracle Archive was able to piece together a record from a proto-Oracle named Alice Wong during her 47th year of existence in the Earth year 2021. Using our latest methods, we found bits and pieces for story through artifacts such as tweets, articles, emails, texts, images, and audio about what it was like to live through these times. If these terms are unfamiliar to you, refer to the Codex on 21st Century Communications. Please explore this exhibit with care and let's gather afterward for a discussion on the connections between our ancestors and the way we live today. And don't forget to visit the gift shop on your way out because some things don't change. I added that part, sorry. Um, and so the, what follows is this timeline with the tweets and memes that describe uh, Alice's experience with barriers to vaccine access. And we'll talk about it more in the, in the discussion. Thanks, Jen. I'm gonna be reading from How I Spend My Catter Days and Nights at Home. Um, it's on page 167 for those of you who might be following along. And I'm starting with um, a section that I really relate to called Inbox Hell. Maybe you relate to it too. Inbox Hell. There are days when I'll check my inbox earlier, especially if I'm expecting an important reply, but I won't do a deep email dive until way after what is typically considered COB, close of business, unless I'm expecting something important or time sensitive. I used to take days off from checking my email, but my inbox ends up becoming a bloated corpse that repels me which ruins the original intent of having less stress. I also delete or mark certain messages as spam and move various emails into folders. Good email hygiene keeps things manageable, although it can take me two to three hours per day. It creeps me out how much time I spend on emails every day. Here are some of the types of emails I receive. Invitation to a conference to submit an essay for a publication or to consult on a project. And I'm going to skip down here, uh, skip a paragraph to read. I have a speaking agent, Emily Hartman of Stephen Barclay Agency. She now manages all my talks and hiring her was one of the best things to happen to me in 2021. It was too much work to become a vendor or to submit forms just to receive an honorarium for a one-time event from a university, a nonprofit, or a company. Over these past few years, I could have written a book titled The Unpaid Work of Getting Paid because it became an untenable energy suck. It may sound fancy or elitist to have a speaking agent, but it's no different than having an assistant or another form of support so I can spend less time on administrative tasks. May we all receive the help we need to make our lives a little more bearable. Beautifully read, both of you. Um, I guess now uh, I get the honor of asking questions that we may share together and think through um, just for, I wonder if I'm, a, I can do this. Uh, no, I can't. Uh, I hope that these questions are accessible to you. I'm happy to share them again uh, with you after the event, um, but I'll try to read these very slowly. Um, my first question for us uh, is a terminological one, which is, how do you define lyrical in comparison to other forms of literary expression? 
what makes something lyrical and what distinguishes lyrical uh, lyrical writing or lyricism, or if defining the lyrical is actually against how you understand the term to be working, what how do you feel like that helps in terms of sort of opening up possibility for lyrical things if we don't want to pin it down uh, to one definition? And I kind of open the floor to the both of you. Uh, I I think I'll go first since I'm now talking. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Um, I just realized I forgot to read the last sentence of my <clears throat> retooled bio, which I think relates. It's the aim of my work is to open up space for healing around place, memory, and ancestral trauma. And before I I knew of the term the lyric essay, um, I had written I had written an essay about in my book this is one way to dance about a friend's suicide, and I I really didn't know what I had the right to say about someone else's death. And I wrote this essay, it's called Street Scene. And when I shared it with her husband and his second wife, um, they said, oh, this is a lyric essay. So that was really the first time I'd heard that term. And I went and looked it up and found Deborah Tall and John Degada's really wonderful definition, which you can find online. Um, and some of it that is that I, that I remember is the importance of gaps, circling, stalking a subject, and meandering. Um, but I think for me, what the, the lyric essay did when I found this form is something I'd been interested in in writing uh, for as long as I can remember, which is the, the idea of language that fractures and its attempt to be spoken. So it's really writing into silence and what, what happens when there's a catch, you know, when there's something that you you can't say in the, the lyric moment allows that rather than trying to gloss over it. So that makes me think of this quote that is in um, an essay that I was going to talk to you all about, about lyric, that's by uh, this wonderful essayist named T. Clutch Fleischman, queer feminist essayist. And, um, and they quote somebody, and I'm not going to remember who it is, so I'm going to have to look back to attribute the quote properly. But in their essay, they quote somebody who says that one of the orange, origins of lyric in lyric poetry is uh, a speaker with an impediment. And that impediment you can interpret poetically in different ways, like an impediment to what they most want. It could be a physical impediment. But I think for me, you know, I really relate to what you just said about breaking the silence, but kind of in a stuttering way. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first learned about Lyric in my MFA program, I, I learned about it. And to me, it was like permission. It was like, oh, so there's a name for this type of writing that I just naturally want to do anyway, that felt to me like not the type of writing that I was supposed to be doing throughout school, right? Like thesis sentence. <laughs> support your argument, conclude your argument. And I always had so much trouble with that, that type of thinking. And then I get to, you know, my MFA program um, at Rainier Writing Workshop, which was just an incredibly supportive place. And, you know, I just start to write about my pain from a very somatic approach. And that bodily approach led me to a form on the page that then was called lyric. And it's because I think now looking back, if I had to actually put a definition on it, to me, lyric is, is about allowing yourself to break all the rules and be able to express yourself in a way that uh, defies majority expectations of Linear, line, what's how do you say that word? Line, linearity, <laughs> writing in a line, um, being chronological, 
following a logical argument and instead being able to write whatever comes up for you. Um, and for me, that turned out to be very associative, um, metaphorical. And then I think another layer to it is that I was a musician before I was a writer. And so again, there's actually a breaking of the rules of writing writing that comes with that, I think, which is that when I write a sentence, it's not a sentence that Grammarly is gonna like. <laughs> like it's just not gonna have proper syntax and all of that. It, it, it has a rhythm to it. And that's what I follow. I follow the rhythm and the vibration more so than you know, rules of how English words are supposed to be strung together. I'm so glad you brought that up, Jen, about one of the other origins of the word lyric, meaning of the liar, which is, in this case, a musical instrument. Uh, and to think about sort of the musical origins of something like poetry before we think of uh, the essay as a genre that exists. And something that I've been trying to connect between both of your responses has been the way that the lyric has been liberatory for you and that it opens up space, right? So it not only opens up uh, space and silence, but also opens up form and time for you to write in a way that's maybe truer to your body, truer to your experience. And there's, um, as you were speaking, I was really struck by the ways in which structures of power and normalcy have made us write in ways that are counter to our bodies. Um, and I think you've offered a way into thinking about lyric as precisely the thing that allows us to do liberatory work. And I think that's so much of what describes Alice's book. Um, and I, I wonder, this is actually related to the second question that I have, uh, which is the way lyrical poetry, for instance, tends to be, tends to involve a deeply subjective first person voice. Um, but we don't always know what that first person I refers to. It may refer to the author. It may refer to another speaker. I'm, I'm curious here if the lyrical is this genre and form that allows you to do liberatory work, how does the lyric enable you to speak to the intersections of your identities? Each of us identify in multiply marginalized ways, um, and sometimes our identities are in tension with one another um, and have, have dimensions that may not be captured by one single term. I'm curious what, why the lyrical for you? Um, and how does writing lyrically demand a kind of labor. And this is a term that I heard us use in our discussion prior to this meeting. Um, what kind of labor does it take to do lyrical work? Um, and how does it make us legible in different ways to different audiences? So I, I don't I don't think that Alice identifies as a lyric writer necessarily or an intersectional, an intersectional writer. So I'm not gonna necessarily put that on her, but I will say <laughs> that I think to me that Alice's book is just such a fabulous example of both of those things. Um, lyric and also, um, I actually, I, I have an essay where I talk about intersectional form. You know, you had asked about intersectional identities. And I have an essay um, where I talk about intersectional form that actually allows for, these multiple layers of our identities to take up space on the page. And I mean, I think that's exactly what Alice's book does. I mean, it's it's so, it's, I mean, it's so, it's just such a pleasure to read. And I think part of it is because of how much um, there is so much of Alice in there and all these different um, identities of Alice in here, right? I mean, you, you talk about breaking breaking rules and um, subverting expectations. Well, when you pick up a memoir, you don't necessarily think that it's going to be primarily. Uh, well, I mean, it's not really primarily anything, right? It's got it's got the can Alice's wonderful Canva designs, the crossword puzzle, photos of um, Alice on Mars, um, and also you know there's a lot of di there's interview there's dialogue there's so much dialogue in this book. 
and talk about like subverting expectations of the I, right? The singular I, it's like, there's graphic dialogue, <laughs> right? There's um, a variety of exchanges uh, where you get to hear this call, call and response. And I just think that, um, I just think it's, it just, it embodies that essence of, of collect, of, of, I guess, being able to see sort of a collective identity through one person's perspective because of the multiple perspectives that she's able to share. And so I call that lyric for sure. Um, and, you know, yeah, suck it ableism. And I think there's another one that's like, fuck you, pay me, right? Just, I mean, if that's not lyric, I don't know what is. <laughs> Food heaven, snack manifestos, all of the above. And, you know, to me, it has a sort of like mixtape effect. I think in the first Tiger Talk, uh, they were talking about zines. And obviously this definitely, you know, I think fits in that lineage of zines. And for me, it's also like a, it's 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 mixtape on paper. Yes. There's the fuck you pay me. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think that, um, I think that that type of labor of, of curation, right, is, is a, uh, I think it's a very political type of labor. Uh, and, and the, the curation that then brings together this like diversity of parts I just feel like it's such a, I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a, uh, it's not even just a metaphor. It just, it, it, it is like creating, it's like, it's a body of work that does honor and, 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 and brings sort of, and brings love to, um, disabled bodies. And I mean, that's, that's, it's just, it is, it is, uh, it is, it is, it's access intimacy in, in page form. And I mean, I think that that is, um, to me, a great example of, of, um, of lyricism. Travis, I'm going to ask you to repeat, repeat the question. After all of that beautiful language, Jen. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, uh, I guess I cheated in the sense that I asked a bunch of questions in one, um, but I, the question is, its foundation is, how do we deal with the fact that the lyric typically involves, in its history at least, the lyric is typically involved this singular I um, that confesses something or speaks about personal experience, and I'm always curious whenever we talk about something like lyric, when we identify as multiply marginalized in different ways, or we have multiplicities within us, how do we consolidate that into a singular I? And in, in, in your writing, does the lyric enable you or uh, in, in, in a particular way to write about the intersections of your identities? And um, this is related to Jen's point right at the end about what kind of labor it takes to write lyrically um, and how it involves making ourselves legible to different audiences when we're in that lyric mode. Does that help? Yes, thank you. I often need to hear things uh, more than once. And I love repetition in pretty much everything, in dance, in writing, in the essay, in poetry. Uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna return to that essay street scene um, that I mentioned about my friend Leanne's uh, passing, her death, and I, I published it in the Kenyan Review online in 2011. And Leanne, actually, this this month, last week was 21 years since she since she uh, died. Um, I France had been really important to her. Paris had been important to her, and I took a trip to Paris in 2004. And in 2005, I started a tenure track job in fiction. And I was teaching 4-4 and I was living in New York City and I was exhausted. And um, I, I'm just interested in what you're saying about labor. I mean, I, feel, I felt like for me to write that essay, um, 
in part, I became a nonfiction writer, even though I'd gotten a job as a fiction writer and had published stories because my my fiction was not legible to editors. They just wanted to see it as nonfiction. They just saw it as autobiographical. And I think at some point, you know, my fiction isn't any more autobiographical than any other fiction. I would, I think, you know, it's not historical, but um, I did also write nonfiction and I kind of kept going into that. And, but it, I, you know, I think women and Asian American women are not granted the imaginative license that white men get all the time, for example. Um, but that essay took me years to write. And at that point, I can, I didn't think about the, the way these things intersected until Jen, you mentioned that you had been a musician. Um, I had been a dancer. Um, and I'd also, uh, I wrote poetry and I applied to MFA programs in poetry and nonfiction, I mean, fiction, not in nonfiction, but it took like my contract not being renewed right before I would have applied for tenure. And kind of, I, I felt like I'd lost everything. I'd staked my whole identity on being a professor and then it was gone. And then I think in a way that, and I was taking these dance classes in New York. I was uh, going to the West Village on, on Sunday mornings and taking this kind of dance class called Five Rhythms. It's improvisational. There's no, there are five rhythms, but you really, it, it forced me to kind of get back in touch with who I am bodily. So I think that somatic, information. I didn't make this connection until now. I think that helped me kind of right into that stuttering, into those silences that were so difficult. Um, there is so much labor in it, you know, and it, it kind of shocked me that, that it was, that someone got it, you know, that, that an editor, that it, I could hear it, right? You can hear it when something rings. And what I felt reading Year of the Tiger was just all of these places where I thought, oh my God, what, of course a book, of course you want a snack manifesto, you know, of course you want childhood pictures of, you know, and, and every time I, I would, each, I was thinking, why aren't all books like this? You know, I, I thought of all the things I had to edit out of this is one way to dance because they didn't fit. You know, I had images, I had, uh, I just, it felt revolutionary. This book felt revolutionary because it, hadn't been straightened out. It was queer, you know, it was unruly and fabulous. Like so, I'd want to dance, I'd want to, da oops, sorry, I interrupted. No, please, please go ahead, keep going. <laughs> I would want to dance with this book on the dance floor. I could even do a dance with this book. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, I love that. I, 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 I think, I mean, that, I, I've had, I want to know the answer to that question. <laughs> why are not, why are more books not like this? Um, because, you know, I'm thinking about in, in music, right? Like songs are often actually collage type um, pieces, right? Like you don't, you rarely, you don't, you usually get a song that tells a story that starts like once upon a time and then ends with like the end. You know, like it, they're very abstract and usually very imagistic. And, you know, if you think about all the different types of um, things that producers do on in, in, in music production, it's, it really is kind of a similar thing to what, you know, Alice does on the page. And so I'm thinking that like, this is one way, another way that we're exposing that Alice is an oracle, right? <laughs> is that this can and should become the norm. Diversity of form. Stagel, I was, I was going to say how much I resonated with the, the pain of, of being in academia. Uh, I just submitted my pre-tenure review dossier today. Uh, and it feels like my career is at that moment of judgment and that that weight of that labor of years upon years of labor that's consolidated into this thing that is now legible to the academy as good work. Um, I, I know that I know that pain very intimately, but something that I've noticed that both of you are gesturing to are the really perverse gates that are kept in our industry. Right, that lyricism as its own form and the writers who write lyric work have to sometimes translate 
or the word you used just now was beautiful, Sajal, straightened out of its queerness in order to be accepted as publishable work. And I think about how many more writers would identify as lyric writers if they were allowed to, how many more writers would feel seen if more work like Alice's were out in the world. Um, and it, it frustrates me, especially now that we're talking about this, that all three of us have experienced forms of ableism, racism, and in this case, I suppose, formalism in the sense that art, the work of our writing has been molded and forced into these containers. And you just talked, Jen, about norms. We Those norms can be so toxic, especially when we are forced to participate in them. Um, and I, I, I thank you both for being so honest about your experiences. Um, and I think that actually leads really well to my third question, which is one that um, Jen gestured to in her response a little bit earlier. Um, so my, my last question is about access intimacy. So for those of you in the audience who may not know what access intimacy is, um, this is a term coined by the incredible activist uh, Mia Mingus uh, to describe a number of experiences and feelings related to having one's access needs understood and met, and those very magical moments of shared solidarity around experiences of access and ableism. So in the spirit of our talk's title, I'm really curious how your writing not only expresses access intimacy, but also enables others to experience that in encounters with your work. Um, so another way of asking that is, how do we create access intimacy in our work and to what ends? I think Alice has offered a model for this and I'm curious what kinds of models you might have each produced yourself. I'll start by saying that for me, uh, writing, writing has been not just an expression of access intimacy, but it's also a really important form of access intimacy for me because it's a form of creativity that fits with my disability. Um, one of the reasons that I had to stop being a musician is because it was just simply too physically demanding. Uh, and it's not something that I could do when I was very sick. And so writing um, has been, you know, something that I can do and often need to do when, when I'm sick, when I'm laid out in bed in a flare up or up all night because of pain. It's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's not just a cathartic outlet. It's, well, it helps me cope definitely, but also has been a way to help me make sense of illness while also feeling connected to something beyond illness. And so I guess I would hope that my writing offers some of that experience to others, just in the sense of maybe being able to um, identify with some of the experience that I try to make visible through my writing. Um, and, you know, especially I think to other spoonies, you know, with invisible disabilities who we're often just made to feel like it's all our faults that we're making this up um, at, for these layers of experience that, that others can't see. And so, you know, I, I think I, I use my writing to make visible things that um, I, I experience daily, but that others cannot see. Um, and then in the process, I think the main message in that is pretty simple. Like in this forthcoming essay collection, the main message is, is really, hey, if you identify with this at all, I see you, you know, and we are not alone in this. And we can and should love our bodies as they are because the problems of the world, you know, might be reflected in our bodies or in the barriers to access and well-being for our bodies, but that's not our fault. And, um, you know, for example, I write about parenting with CPTSD and chronic pain. And I also write about tocophobia, which is a little known pathological phobia of pregnancy and childbirth that can cause delusions. And, and as I make that experience visible, um, 
I would like to think that there would be maybe reach others who would feel that, wow, like, you know, I've had to keep this a secret or I haven't understood this myself. And, you know, we, we, we are okay. Like, no, there, it's, it's not our fault. We see each other and we're okay. And I think that's, that's a kind of beginning to access intimacy. So I, I read from Alice's book. Um, I, I wanted to, I was, first I wanted to read It's a Chinese Thing. I just love that. This is, it's a few hours after my first meal. I drink at least one piping hot mug of water. Anyway, I love this section, but I chose inbox hell because that is my experience of email. And when I, when I published my book, I got lots of invitations to speak and I could not have, uh, I did not get an official diagnosis for ADHD until I was in my forties because I had performed wellness. <clears throat> um, I'd been told to get to, 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 uh, to go and get tested when I was in graduate school, but I kept losing the paper. So, you know, my doctor and I would laugh about it because I thought, well, it's kind of obvious. Why do I have to go get tested for it? Um, so I just, one of the, one of the things that was interesting for me when I published my book was that I had well, two things happened. I needed an extension. I had to do a revision. And I don't think that's unusual, writers needing extensions. But I, um, I'll go right here. Yeah, I, I brought up my neurodiversity um, to my editor. I'd never disclosed anything in a professional context before. But, and again, thank you, Kenyon Review Online. Kenyon Review had published an essay of mine that I wrote and published after I had finished my, I finished my manuscript. So I'd written, this is one way to dance. It was going through peer review um, at University of Georgia Press, which published it. But then, then I published this other essay called, Even If You Can't See It, Invisible Disability and Neurodiversity. And that went viral. I mean, it was kind of a shock. I mean, it, it was shocking to me but my editor had seen it. And so I wrote and I said, I'm, I'm gonna need a, I'm gonna need more time. And I said, I don't know if you saw this, but here's why. And, and he said, I did, and that's fine. And I, I felt, I felt a lot of shame about asking, like I thought I should be able to do this, but I, I, I couldn't. Um, so I needed that. And I, I'm grateful that it worked out that way because in my book, I think without realizing it, I did try to perform wellness anyway. I think coming from this dance background and, you know, it was like, here's my book. And I didn't write about, um, I didn't write directly about any kind of disability. Um, I kind of danced around it. But in that essay, um, and in fact, I published it under Sajel A. Shaw and not Sajel Shaw. And nothing else I've published in I think in 20 years, did I use my middle initial? But my middle initial is how I am in the rest of my life. I've always used my middle initial. So it was interesting. I almost had to have another persona to write about kind of the sexual harassment that I went through in graduate school and at, and at my job and kind of what happened. And it was, you know, it was interesting because I think that then people were able to read things into my book that I hadn't been able to put there because I gave it this other context. Um, I have, as usual, lost where we were going. So I'm going to hand it back to you, Travis. <laughs> I am uh, aware of time. And one thing I wanted to offer to each of you, um, aside from my questioning, uh, is whether or not you had anything you, you'd like to share with the audience. Is there something about the lyric and maybe elements of what we've talked about this evening that you would like to say in, in as a means of closing? Um, I know that I'm going to hand it over to Sandy after we sort of give our final remarks, but I wanted to give each of you a moment to share something with the audience if you'd like. 
I would like to share something about labor, just the labor that goes into creating something lyric, but also just, I'm gonna go just go back to inbox hell, you know, the unpaid work of getting paid. Um, I think the importance of valuing our own labor. And I think for me, I have a postcard here that says what yes comes from no. Uh, and feeling okay, it's really hard to say, I mean, just, but to, to use your no to protect your time and to be more honest. I think I felt like I couldn't be honest about what my bandwidth actually was. But in order to have these lyric moments, in order to dance, you have to have some space, right? Lyric works with space. If your entire schedule is crowded, if you're, well, my inbox is full. I don't know, is anybody's inbox not full? I mean that, you know, but I, I, I love that she has something about her inbox and what it's like to the, like the, that, how much time do we all spend on email? And so there are these wonderful, funny parts. There are, but I, I just appreciated it's that make, it's like visible mending, right? Making the work visible. Um, I, I think that's so important to me. Process is so important. And for all that I love and appreciate the lyric leaps, I also love process and work made visible and made material. So I'll also refer back to Alice's book and um, and and to underscore what Sage all had just said about valuing our own labor. So I feel like this is a especially affirming part where Alice reminds us, you're a snack. So in this context, I'm gonna interpret that as always value your own labor. Uh, because we are in a capitalist society where labor, our labor is exploited at the same time as it is marginalized. And so while we may pour our hearts into labors of love, the next day, somebody who has access, different type of access from what we are talking about, um, to decision-making and rulemaking might tell us, your labor does not fit into what is valuable in my set, meaning the dominant set of mainstream rules. And that's, and this, this is a direct Alice Wong quote applicable to many things, that's bullshit. Um, so I think that I would just say that just as I started out talking about how lyric is about liberation and permission, that our labor is, um, about care and love. And we're the ones that assign that value. Nobody else does. And this whole Tiger Talk series that Alice has set up and been so uh, kind to invite us into and that the Longmore Institute and Sandy um, have, have been, uh, such a such such incredible team members of is let me just pull back the curtain for you all. Um, we were all talking about this, Sajel and Travis and I um, uh, in the prep call that that the way that Alice designs and the way that everyone else has executed these uh, these tiger talks is an example and a model of a labor of love that stands very apart from I would say too too many of the types of um uh of uh i think requests for speaking requests for labor that many of us get uh this whole time it's been very much about access intimacy it's what do you need um we are going to pay you <laughs> we're going to make sure that you feel supported and so just want to give props to everyone that's involved in this and also and that includes everyone who is listening and um, participating through the Q&A and on social media. So thank you. I mean, I don't know how 
what better way to end our conversation than with that sentiment. Um, I, uh, I want to echo the fact that this is a labor of love, uh, and I'm, I'm so grateful to be able to share this with my co-panelists and with Alice, Sandy, and Emily, and all the interpreters and captioners who make this possible. Uh, there's so much labor that goes on behind the scenes, and um, this to me, to put another word that means a lot to me in disability studies, this is interdependence. Uh, at large. Um, and as a result, um, I, I could not be happier to be part of this event. Um, and I will now turn it over to, I believe, Sandy, or it could be Emily, uh, for the uh, book prizes and uh, final remarks. Hi, everyone. This is Sandy speaking. Um, first, I uh, just wanted to say um, so much gratitude to our panelists. Um, Jen and Sejo and our moderator extraordinaire Travis um, and of course a shout out to my co-collaborator and host of the series Longmore Institute and specifically Emily um, behind the scenes. Um, so I am now going to announce the winners of the book giveaway. So there's um, five books that are being given away. Um, and I do apologize in advance for mispronouncing of any names, um, but appreciate your grace and patience. So uh, winners of uh, This Is One Way to Dance by Sejo Shah are Christine Germans, Jen Rorig, Laura Nash, Renee Dexter, and Victoria Valenzuela. Um, and also before I forget, there's going to be a link in the chat for winners to use to request their book, specifically what format um, you would like your book in for access purposes. And also um, the form will include a place for you to enter information for us to actually get the books to you. The winners of Travis Lau's pairing um, are Charis Hall, Georgina Mann, Kathleen Mozak, Miranda K. Giwa Onaiwu, and Steve K. And so again, um, I think Emily just included the link into the chat for uh, winners of the book giveaways. And then uh, last but not least, of course, winners of Year of the Tiger by Alice Wong. There are 10 books being given away. Um, and those winners are Toy Suleiman, Aster Y. Wu, Shanika Svetvilas, Don Wood, Hallie Felt, Kira Pelletier, Margaret Lush, Richard Gallo, Sejal Mehta, and Jonathan Maggot. And then um, the third event uh, that's happening next month in this series of Tiger Talks. Uh, the theme of the next Tiger Talk is revolutionary embodiment, disabled presence, connections, and futures. And the panelists of next month's Tiger Talk series is Leo Lakshmi Piepshna Summer Singha, Sammy Shock, and that conversation will be moderated by Subini Anima. So that's happening November 9th at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. And um, just wanted to thank everybody for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon next month.